it's a pleasure to have Dr. Sarah Sola from Northwestern here for an invited uh, talk. This is the second and final uh, talk of the session. Thank you. Actually, this is my, my first cosign, so it's, it's very exciting to, to be here. And uh, uh, this is going to be a very, very different <laughs> talk, very different talk from the previous talk which was a beautiful, beautiful wealth of, of amazing experimental data. I am a theorist, and I am very lucky to be able to collaborate very closely with an experimental monkey lab, which is the lab of Lee Miller. And the work that I'm going to tell you about today was done in collaboration with Juan Gallego, who was a postdoc at the lab at that time. He's now back home in Spain, and he's looking for a faculty position. So if you're looking for a, an amazing, amazing young scientist, go ahead and hire him. Uh, Matthew Perich was a graduate student in the Miller Lab. He's now a postdoc uh -huh. and, uh, at EPFL. And uh, this is not working? Yes, it's working. Okay. And uh, uh, Rahit Chowdhury is still a graduate student at the lab. So I wanted to show you a video to begin with, but I had a little bit of a technical problem. So I want you to imagine for a second Nadal serving every time it's his turn to serve. He has a very peculiar way of arcing his body and hitting the ball when it comes down, and he always does it in exactly the same way. You can watch video after video after video of Nadal serving, and it's amazing how reproducible this behavior is. So this is the topic of my talk today. What happens when you have learned a motor behavior and you keep on executing it year after year after year in a very consistent manner. And it could be you riding your bike or playing a, an instrument or Nadal serving in his uh, tennis games. How, how do we do this? How does this happen in, in the brain and in the body? So now forget about Nadal because there won't be any Nadal. There will be just a monkey doing a very simple task, but it is also, um, a learned task that the monkey can repeat in a very consistent manner from the behavioral point of view over weeks and months and even years in the lab. So the, the behavior is very consistent. You look at it at day one, you look at it at day end, and it is the same behavior. So what, is, what can be underlying this behavior? How can this be achieved? So there has to be something in your motor cortex. Remember that your motor cortex is just two synapses away from your muscle. Motor cortex projects into motor neurons in your spinal cord, and that innervates the muscles that cause the movement. So there has to be a plan, there has to be a dynamic plan in motor cortex that is as stable as that movement, for that movement to be stable. So that was our hypothesis. Is there an underlying pattern of neural activity in motor cortex that is stable, and this is what then you run your, your uh, um, dynamics in the brain, and this runs the dynamics down your arm, and therefore your behavior is very reproducible and stable over time. So how could we check for this? How could we check not for the behavior consistency over time, which we can simply observe, but how would we check for the neural dynamics consistency over time? Well, it would be very simple if we could monitor all the neurons in motor cortex. So I record all the neurons in motor cortex on day one. I record all the neurons in motor cortex on day N. I look at the dynamics and I check whether they are doing the same thing. And then I go home. I said, okay, my hypothesis works. It was true. There is an underlying neural dynamics that is stable. But the problem is that we cannot record all the neurons in motor cortex. If we could, we would be a little bit in this situation that was described uh, yesterday in the beautiful talk by Kenneth Harris where he was talking about an infinity, being able to record all the neurons in a given area. So assume for a moment that we could do this, that we could really record all the neurons in day one, all the neurons in day n, and create a matrix, which is a little bit like the matrix that Eric Shea Brown was telling you about yesterday. So it's a matrix where each column represents an instant of time. So this is time equals one, times e t, t plus one, t plus t. So I'm thinking of time as a discrete variable. You choose your resolution delta, you add that delta and you construct the success successive bins. And the capital T is just the duration of this movement in this discrete time measured in units of delta. And then you're measuring n infinity neurons. You're measuring all the neurons. Oops, the other one. 
you're measuring all the neurons, so you have N1, N2, uh, all the way up to N infinity. If you were in motor cortex, N infinity, which is the number of neurons that is modulated for, by a simple arm reach, that would be of the order of a million. That would be your N infinity in this case. So you will have this N infinity by T matrix, or by T plus one, depending on how you can find. And you compute it on day one, you compute it on day end, you look at the matrix and you said, yes, the dynamics is the same or not. But unfortunately, that's not what we can do. What we can do is not compute, not monitor this whole neural space, because we cannot record all the neurons that participate in the motion. We can only record a subset of those neurons. And again, you saw uh, in, in um, Kenneth Harris' talk yesterday what that subset is, how we went historically from being able to record from one neuron to two to 100 to 10,000, but still we cannot record a million in, in the motor cortex of a non-human primate. So we just have a few electrodes, let's say typically what we implant on, on the motor cortex of the monkeys are about 100 uh, wires, it's a 10 by 10 electrode array. And so we have a few neurons which could be excitatory or inhibitory, they are within this motor cortex network, and we record their spikes. So this is not the, the true neural space, it's an empirical neural space, is what I think Kenneth called the environmental uh, dimension, which is just simply the number of neurons for which you can get experimental data. Now, we are very lucky because something unexpected happens when we record all those neurons. So we, in this case, I'm showing you I'm recording from three neurons, and every, I, you know, at every time step, I get put a dot in this N1, N2, N3 empirical neural space, and as the, the task is uh, executed, or as some, there is some dynamics in the brain, what happens is that these points that describe a trajectory in the neural space, no matter how long you wait, they will not fill the space. They will live in a low dimensional manifold, which is actually containing the dynamics of the system. And this again was the topic of, of Eric's uh, talk yesterday. What about the connectivity of the network generates this low dimensional dynamics? Is it, and, the, and one of the answers he provided for us is because you've learned the task. And by learning the task, you have modified the connectivity in your network so that the manifold is constructed. And this manifold is now a task-specific manifold in which the system evolves every time you want to reproduce this task. So now my, my job is a little bit simpler because I don't have to check for stability or consistency of the neural dynamics in the whole space. I only have to look for the stability of the neural dynamics within the manifold to which this dynamics is confined. And this is already a much lower dimension than the environmental dimension of all the neurons that we might be recording from. So this is a great tool, and uh, it keeps on appearing in many, many places, is the idea of, uh, of a neural manifold, of a, of a low dimensional surface, or it could be flat surface, it could be a hyperplane, it could be a curved surface, but it's a low dimensional mathematical surface to which the dynamics is confined. And its dimensionality is much less than the neural space of which the surface is embedded. So this is the concept of a manifold, so here again, I show you again, N1, N2, N3, these three axes are the three neurons that are monitoring, and the, the dynamics is confined to this space, which is subtended by U1 and U2. U1 and U2 are the bases that define the space. This is the case of a flat dimension equal to two in the language of the talk we heard yesterday. Um, the, the, the manifold could be curved, it doesn't have to be flat, and then you will have to be a little bit more careful about our tools for dimensionality reduction where we are going to do a linear or a non-linear dimensionality reduction. So this concept of the manifold is very powerful and is what I'm going to exploit in the rest of my talk to, to address and resolve the question that I posed at the beginning. Just to do a little bit of advertisement for ourselves, we wrote a, a little um, review and perspective article on how these neural manifolds appear in the control of movement. But the important thing is that these neural manifolds are really ubiquitous. They don't appear only in motor areas, they appear also in prefrontal areas, parietal areas, sensory areas such as visual, auditory, olfactory. And we have been in our group very immersed in this idea of doing research using the concept of manifolds. So you know what happens when you are excited about something and you talk a lot about it among yourselves and you only talk to other people who are working on similar topics, you think that this is the only interesting topic in the world, right? So when I was looking at these beautiful statistics that Adam Calhoun has been gathering for, for Cosine, I said, but where are the manifolds? So my proposal was that this plot should be actually become this plot. 
And if you come out of this talk with this idea, then I've succeeded immensely. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I also want you to think, to think of these uh, manifolds in a slightly different way, and I think this is going to relate to some of the talks that we will be listening, uh, hearing tomorrow from Manu Sahani and other people, which is the idea of latent variables and a generative model. So what do I mean by latent variables? So I told you that you have this flat, and you only have to worry about this manifold, in which there is a basis that spans the manifold. This basis is composed by a sm relatively small number of vectors because that's the low dimensionality of the manifold. And now, instead of thinking of exciting individual neurons, I want you to think of exciting those vectors, those directions, which are particular combinations of neurons, right? Which are really the modes of the system. If the manifold is flat, the modes span the whole manifold. If the manifold is curved, then you have to have a local basis that changes as you move around the manifold, but you will always have a spanning set, a low dimensional set of combinations of neurons. And so our idea is that these are the building blocks that you don't go around exciting individual neurons, that you go around in the cortex exciting groups of neurons, patterns of neurons with a particular relative proportion, particular relative weights, and this is your latent dynamics. So this is, for instance, I've excited mode one in this particular temporal pattern, I've excited mode two in this particular pattern, and now by doing a linear combination of this latent dynamics, which is the temporal activation of mode one and mode two, I can actually generate the spice. So in, um, my, my colleague Surya Ganguly has a beautiful sentence, a little bit provocative and extreme, that describes this idea. And he says, and those of you who work on single neurons will get very offended, but he says, single neurons are just one-dimensional projections, one-dimensional random projections of the latent dynamics. So the latent dynamics is occurring in the manifold, and a single neuron is just an axis, you know, oriented in some manner relative to the manifold on which the latent dynamics is projected. And when you put an electrode on that neuron, that's what you see, just the projection of the latent dynamics onto that neuron. So this is the idea that we are going to, that you need to have in the back of your mind for the rest of the talk. And I want to now give you a couple of ideas of how we use this to answer the question that I asked at the beginning, and I'm going to be referring to a very specific task, which is a very common task in motor control, which is a center out task. The monkey is fixating at the center. There are eight circles surrounding the center. One of them flashes. When the monkey gets a go signal, he makes a movement to the desired target and comes back. And there are eight targets. It's a delayed response task. And while you are waiting for the go signal, we'll be, I will show you data from, prima, from PMD. And while you are, the task is being executed, I'll be, be showing, I'll be showing you data from M1, which is primary motor cortex, and S1, so that you also see the sensory feedback coming in. I want to show you for this particular monkey that the behavior is very, very, very stable. Days between sessions, look at the horizontal axis here, 800. Okay, so this is data that has been taken not for weeks or months, but over years. And this is, these are the trajectories to the eight targets. These are the profiles of the X and Y components of the velocity. Ah, you don't see my cursor. Okay, it's not my computer. Okay. Um, you, see the, uh, you see the X and Y components of the velocity, also very stable over time. And you see the, the, the hand velocity, both X and Y components remain very correlated with themselves over time, and actually the correlation of the hand velocity is almost one. However, if I now look, I make this construction at, at different days, and I ask myself, okay, on different days, what is the structure of the neural code? I can see that it is very, very, very different. So here I, um, well, I'll be showing you data from, as I said, from motor cortex and pre-motor pre -motor cortex, pre-motor cortex and sensory cortex. And here I'm showing you at the top data from one particular monkey. The electrode was implanted in M1 primary motor cortex. I'm showing you 80 neurons on day 27, 84 neurons on day 43. You can see it below the, the neural rasters that the X and Y components of velocity are very, very stable. However, next. The X and Y components of velocity are very, very stable. However, you can see that the neural representations are not. Here, you have see, ras you see rasters are grouped according to each one of the eight directions of the targets. And there is clearly a lack of correspondence between the neural dynamics. And why is that? It's because on day 43, we are not recording from the same neurons that we were recording on day 27. 
These electrodes are raised are unstable. Sometimes they go deeper, sometimes they move. New neurons are being captured by the array. Some of the electrodes maybe get short-circuited because it is scar tissue, so some neurons get lost. So the neurons that I'm recording on day K are not the same neurons that I'm recording on day one. So now, not only we have to think of, of uh, neural space, which was empirical, but we have to also think of manifolds that are empirical and are being projected onto slightly different neural spaces. So now, how do I resolve this problem? How can I tell you whether there is a master dynamics that is being conserved when some days I'm looking at it projected on some manifold and other days I'm looking at it projecting in some other manifold? How am I going to answer the question of whether there was an underlying dynamics that was stable? So our hypothesis is that this stable dynamics exists, that there is this, this master neural space with n infinity neurons, 10 to the 6 neurons, and in this true neural space, there is a true manifold whose dimension we do not know. And in this true manifold, there is a dynamics that is totally stable. Now, on some days I'm projecting this on, on a neural space, and other days I'm projecting it on a different neural space. And then in each one of these empirical neural spaces, I can monitor, I can construct a, an empirical manifold. And the question is, how am I going to extract from this mosaics of empirical manifolds in different places, some conservation of the true dynamics in the true manifold. So this is what the question that we are asking, right? So we are asking the question whether we know that the subject consistently performed the same behavior over days, but we cannot record the same neurons over such a period. We hypothesize that the true latent dynamics associated with consistent behavior should be stable, but we need to compensate for the fact in order to prove this, that the dynamic, the true latent dynamics are being projected onto different empirical manifolds on different days. So this is, this is what is happening, we believe. This would be the, your true neural space with your true uh, neural manifold, which is in, uh, at this point some kind of mystical object, right? Because we cannot access it experimentally. And on a given day, we are measuring some neurons and one and two and three. We, we have an, an empirical space, which is an embedding space. We have an empirical manifold. And in this manifold, you observe some dynamics. And they, we come later on day N, and now we are measuring different neurons. And so we have a different embedding space and a different empirical manifold. And what we want is a procedure that allows us to align not the manifolds, because these manifolds actually live in different spaces, but allows us to directly uh, um, align the dynamics. And our, um, our idea here was the following, and, and this is, I want to give this as a little bit of advice for all of you who are theorists. Our idea, of course, was to start with linear methods. First of all, you should always start with linear methods because you, these methods are unambiguous and everybody will agree that you do something in a certain way and everybody will get the same result. You should also be very skeptical because when your system is not linear and complex, the linear results might build an intuition that is actually wrong. So you should be very, you should do it, but you should be very skeptical and careful about the results that you're obtaining. But here, we actually thought that we were on the right track by using a linear method, because essentially, what I want to do is align the dynamics in such a way that I'm compensating for the fact that the true dynamics has been projected onto two different manifolds. And the projection itself is a linear operation. So there is a conceptual hope that a linear method would allow me to align the dynamics. And that's ex exactly what happened. We were lucky. It's not like one of these cases where uh, Eric said, I'm desperate and I go home. In this case, I wasn't desperate and I came here instead of going home. So it, uh, it, was, a good, um, <laughs> it was a good outcome. So um, I'm telling you the same thing. I don't need to tell you that again. So this is what we do. We take our data matrix on day N. Remember the data matrix was this matrix that every row is a different neuron and every column is a different time, discrete time. Uh, the spanning the duration of the task. So we have a day N data matrix, a day M data matrix, and we do a singular value decomposition of both of them. N, and we embed these matrices in a space of dimension N when N is the cardinality of the union set of the neurons. So I said, these are the neurons that are recorded in day one, N. These are the neurons that are recorded in day M. I put them all together. Some of them will be common. Some of them will only be active in day N and some only be active in day M. So I put them all together. So N, the total number of neurons is the cardinality of the union set. 
And what, if, if I'm looking at the end and I say, well, these neurons were not recorded, I just set those activities equal to zero. And vice versa for the other day, the neurons that were not recorded. So once we have these two data, the, the, these two data matrices, what we do is very simple. I want to compute. Now I have created a space in which both manifolds can exist by creating the union of these neurons. And I can ask myself, what, how are these manifolds oriented in the space? I can ask myself where they are located by computing their center of mass and the distance and measuring the translation. But I'm more interested in the relative orientation of these flat manifolds. So I can compute the angles between them, and that's very simple. You get the matrices U of the singular value decomposition, these matrices, the left matrices, and you truncate them instead of having keeping all columns, all n columns, you only keep the first d columns. And d would be what was defined yesterday as the planar dimension. That would be the dimensionality of the flat manifold. And so you construct what I call u tilde and uh, u tilde n and u tilde m, which are just keeping only the first d columns. You construct the inner product matrix, and you do a singular value decomposition of that inner product matrix. The diagonal lambda, the diagonal sigma, sorry, the elements of that diagonal are the ordered cosines of the principal angles that explain to me how this, what is the relative orientation of these two surfaces in the full space. And this is comparing the d-dimensional hyperplane spanned by the first d columns of UM and the d-dimensional hyperplane spanned by the d, the d principal columns of UM where d is the flat dimension. So, this is actually not the, the most uh, interesting thing to compute those angles because those angles, either there will be common neurons, common directions, and those angles will be zero, or there will be directions that are completely not common, and those angles will be 90 degrees. So to look at that collection of angles is not the most interesting thing. But the interesting thing is now to project our data matrices Xn and Xm onto those manifolds. We do that. We project them using, again, the, the well, now the row using the, the columns of UM and UN as rows. And we project now into data that is in the manifold. This data matrix is also dimension D by T, where D is the flat dimension, is the, the dimensionality of the hyperplane. And T, as before, is the duration of the task in these discrete time units whose resolution, whose resolution you choose. And now we use a tool that is called canonical correlation analysis, which is very, very useful and interesting, which allows us actually to correlate the dynamics. And what this does, so we take the matrix, this matrix is L, which is the data confined to the manifold. We do a QR decomposition. For those of you who are physicists, it is the same as doing like a Graham Schmidt. You take the first vector and you normalize it. You take the second vector, you make it perpendicular to the first vector and normalize it and, and go on. This is what the QR decomposition does. And this gives me a basis, essentially, for the dynamics. So now I have the matrices Q, which are the basis. And again, I do a Q transpose Q, they N, they M. So again, an inner product, and again, a singular value decomposition. You can get a lot of mileage of a singular value decomposition. So the canonical correlation analysis allows me to get two transformations, two linear transformations, one in the N, they N, and one of the they M manifold, so that now I'm going to describe that trajectory. It's not from the original coordinate system, but from the new coordinate system. It's not a rotation. It involves these matrices R, so it's not a rotation. The U's would give me rotations, the U's and the V's. The matrix R is not, um, the matrix R is, so these matrices are orthogonal, but the matrix R is not, is remixing what the Graham Schmidt unmixed, essentially. And so, but it's a linear transformation, so you'll get directions that are not necessarily perpendicular, and, and, and you'll have stretches and compressions that are different along different axes, but it's a linear transformation. And the, the, the diagonal matrix will give me the canonical correlations um, sorted from larger to smaller. So we can do this. And this is what we get. So now I'll show you results from, from these data that have been recorded. So for instance, this is a day one versus day 32, three-dimensional latent, latent space, three-dimensional manifold. Neural mode one, neural mode two, neural mode three are the axes, and I'm showing them color-coded the trajectories depending on to which one of the eight targets the reach movement was done. So this is what they look on day one. This is what they look on day 32. Then I align the dynamics, that is to say I do a transformation 
on this neural space and near transformation in neural space, and this is what the dynamics look like. So first of all, they look like each other, and second, the, you see these petals, these eight petals that correspond to the eight targets that were already mixed and untangled here, and they have become beautifully separated and detangled. And if you look at the color code, you will see that they are arranged as they should be in the same order as they are the targets in the physical space. So these are the canonical correlations plotted as a function of time. This is the, the, the gray curve at the top is what I call within, meaning I take the data from one day and I align the first half of the data to the second half of the data, just simply to compensate for the daily fluctuations. And then, of course, if I do that every day, I get a very steady curve. If I don't align the dynamics and without aligning them, I compute the correlations, I see something that has decayed dramatically. But if I align the dynamics, you can see that the correlations go up exactly, almost exactly to the same value. So is this um, particular to that particular monkey? This is the data that I show you for 45 days. Here I'm showing you similar data for 70 days. This is again day, the yellow is unaligned, the red or sienna is aligned. Here I have another monkey, 500 days, also primary motor cortex, 700 days. And the, the, this has been aligned properly. Why is this important? First of all, it's important because if there wasn't a, a true manifold in which the dynamics were stable, and if it wasn't that I'm, I'm compensating for projections of different manifolds, I would not have been able to align it in this particular way. So this establishes that our I, initial hypothesis, which is there is a, an N infinity neural space in which there is a true manifold, and in that true manifold the dynamics is stable, is indeed a correct hypothesis. It's also very important if you're going to be interested, if you happen to be interested in brain machine interfaces, because this is the dynamical data that will be recorded and decoded to create a prediction of X, Y position of the reach or forces that you're exerting on an external object. So this is what we did next. We checked whether this allowed us to to stabilize the decoding of movement kinematics. Again, here we are concentrating on the X and Y components of velocity. We are just recording from, from primary motor cortex. This is a neural activity. We project the neural activity onto the co corresponding manifold and the latent variables, so the manifold activities, the activation of the neural modes, are the inputs to a very simple linear model that tells me what are the X and Y components of velocity as I reach to each one of the eight possible targets. So if I construct a, a decoder every day in the first part of the session, that decoder performs very well for the rest of the day. That again is the gray data on top. If I construct a decoder on day one and I keep on applying to my latent space of the day without correcting for the dynamics alignment, the performance of that decoder goes way down. And, but if I align the dynamics before providing it as input to the decoder, then the performance of the decoder is very well stabilized. And this is very important because otherwise the way to compensate for this drift or this acquisition and loss of neurons would be to retrain a decoder, a new decoder every day, which means that you as a user would have to adapt yourself to a new decoder every day. It's like every day I give you a completely different model of car and you have to adapt to drive it and you never begin to feel that the car is part of your body, that you know exactly where it ends and how big it is and how easy it is to maneuver it. So um, just to complete the picture, so that we can record these dynamics in a very stable manner. Again, um, these are, this is the monkey I just showed you. This is a 70-day monkey J. This is a 500-day monkey M. And this is a 700-day monkey C when it was implanted, implanted on the right side. Um, how much more time do we have? OK. I'll show you this in this data. So, so far I have been showing you data from M1, which has been recorded here while once the go queue came on and the movement was actually being executed. But I will now show you er data earlier in the game during the wait period in which your, uh, the premotor cortex shows preparatory activity. And I'm going to ask whether there is a similar structure in that other part of the cortex. And the answer is yes, this is the stability of the PMD latent dynamics. Again, this is the correlations, days between sessions. This is a uh, monkey C now on the, on the left side. Um, 
gray curve is the, what we call latent within, again, meaning the correlations within the same day, the day with itself, just to compensate for fl daily fluctuations. The yellow is how it would deteriorate just if you don't correct for dynamics alignment. And the Siena is the correction after alignment. And again, is this meaningful to understanding the behavior? Yes, it is. In this case, the prediction the, is not a prediction of X and Y components of velocity, but it's just a classifier that looks at the activity in premotor cortex and tries to predict to which one of the eight targets the monkey is planning to make a motion. And again, so we, you record in premotor activity, you create a classifier model that gives you a probability of the target given the neural activity and predicts the target. And again, if you, if you do the, it within days, is the gray uh, dots. The green dots are show the deterioration if you don't align across days. And the blue dots shows how you recover performance if you do the kinematic, the dynamics alignment. And finally, I want to show you that the same thing applies if you record during the execution time, you record in a somatosensory area S1, which is where you receive the feedback, the proprioceptive feedback about the motion. And it's again a very similar, um, sorry. I keep, <laughs> sorry about that. There, the stability of S1 dynamics. So here again, we um, create a, a, a model from S1 activity to predict the motor output. And again, you can see the, the recovery of the correlations. So the, in gray, the original correlations. In yellow, the deteriorating correlations. In Siena, the recovered correlations after you align the dynamics. And on this side, what happens to your predictive accuracy from whether, how well from the sensory feedback are you able to predict the accuracy of your movements. And again, you see that we recover essentially in a statistically undistinguishable manner, we recover the accuracy of the, of the predictor. So this is the message that I want you to take home because if you work with monkeys and you have run into this problem of all the things that people do to try to stabilize recordings over a long time, <laughs> this is the most impressive picture that you might have seen and this is what I want you to remember. First of all, I want you to remember this big red word manifold on top of the important words. And second, I want you to remember that this has been stabilized over 700 days. So here, which I show you that the correlation for this monkey CR has been pulled back from this deteriorating performance to a performance which is equivalent to how the data is correlated with itself on any single day by aligning the dynamics using this very simple a canonical correlation analysis. And here is the predictive accuracy of the latent dynamics, again, with a decoder that has been trained on day one and would perform very, very poorly due to the deterioration of the changes in the, in the population of recorded neurons. But if you do the dynamics, the alignment of the dynamics, then everything works again. And, and this is essentially the, the conceptual picture that underlies it all. And this is the underlying reason why such a simple method as canonical correlations, which is a linear method, allows us to do the job. It's because the, although the, the true manifold may be very curvilinear and we, we don't know how to characterize it and we don't know, we don't have the data, the experimental data to trace it, it's pro we are projecting it onto flat subspaces. And these flat subspaces then it's not a, we're not aligning the subspaces, but we can change the coordinates within each subspace in a linear manner so that in this new coordinate system, the dynamics looks the same. It's like, I, you know, I look at this bottle this way or I look at this bottle this way, but it's the same bottle. I'm just looking at the object from a different perspective. I can be projecting it in different ways, but I should be it should be possible to align these projections. And where do we go from here? Well. Everything that I have showed you so far is for a very stereotype task. Like you bring the monkey to the lab and the monkey is very well trained in doing this eight, eight um, target central task. The question is the question of natural behaviors. When we study sensory systems, we want to expose the sensory system to the statistics of natural images or natural auditory scenes. We want to be able to monitor the motor system in, nat in a natural behavior scene. So our next generation of experiments is monkeys on a cage. We are uh, measuring telemetrically uh, 
getting the activity of, again, the, of the order of 100 neurons in primary motor cortex. We are monitoring at the same time activity in a variety of muscles and also monitoring by video the actual behavior of the monkey. And so the goal for the next couple of years is to be able to do the same kind of analysis, ask ourselves what are the manifolds for these tasks that are going to be more complex than the simple central task? Do we see, can we use the dimensionality of these manifolds as a measure of the task complexity? Do we see transitions in the dimensionality of the underlying manifold as the monkey moves from one task to the other one? And we believe that for the tasks that are very well learned and repeat, repeated in a very stereotypical manner from the behavioral point of view, each one of those tasks has its associated manifold, the task-specific manifolds that you acquire, that you refresh uh, during practice, but that you fall into every time that some instruction tells you this is the task that you will be executing next. And that ends what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. We have time for questions. Thank you. Um, thank you for your talk. I was wondering if you've controlled, uh, done a control for uh, overfitting in any way, for example, by performing this analysis on white noise and seeing if you impose some patterns that don't actually exist. We, we have done so many controls that the, the, the supplementary material for the controls is three times longer than the paper. So, <laughs> and courtesy of referees that are as inquisitive as you are and said, what about your controls? But yes, you can control for uh, overfitting. You can, you can uh, shuffle data to understand what is the background and to understand that you're being significant about background. You can divide data on any given day in different manners so as to see that you have consistency over days. There are many different controls. And one control that is very, very nice, actually, is from a, a proposed by a paper by Elsa Yed and Cunningham, in which they propose generating artificial data using a maximal entropy uh, setup that was constrained, for instance. Do I want to preserve the covariance between neurons? Do I want to preserve the covariance a long time? Do I want to preserve the covariance between targets? And you can generate ensembles of, of artificial data, artificially generated data that, that preserve these conditions, and then you can check your analysis on these ensembles and make, understand better what is, that is, what constraints are the ones that are important to the dimensionality of reduction. Oops, go over here. So, uh, here. Oh. <laughs> so you have nicely shown that the behavior is stable and the neural dynamics is stable. I was wondering if, um, uh, those two are, are linked in the sense that for some monkeys, maybe I've, I think that there was a tiny bit of a decay in your correlation. Th is it predictive from a, a, a bit of decay in the behavior? Uh, that's a very good question. I haven't looked into that. That's a very good question. But also remember that I was showing you time scales that were very different for different monkeys. So you were seeing decay maybe over 800 days that you didn't see over 40 days. So, but that's a very good question, whether there is a decay in the, in the for instance, X and Y comp correlation between X and Y component of velocity that is accompanying that decay in the neural correlation that I cannot compensate for. Thank you. Um, here, um, so I just, thanks for the talk, and I just want to ask for this, is there any assumption in this method that the true latent variable manifold um, stays in the in dimension, uh, infinite dimensional space, that manifold is the same on every day? Or is it a, also there's something can be allowed that this manifold can also kind of rotate or stretch in that infinite dimensional space? Uh, we assume that it was the same. And we assume that the variability that we need to compensate for is due to to limitations of our recording methods that cannot keep on recording the same neurons. We, the underlying assumption is that if you could record all neurons in a completely stable manner, then once you acquire a manifold, for acquiring a behavior in our view is acquiring the manifold associated for that behavior. And if the behavior is stable, it's because the manifold itself is stable and the dynamics within that manifold is stable. Um, 
maybe can I just additional question, sorry. And it's a bit similar as the first question. So uh, if we take two trajectories that um, actually comes from two different um, manifolds, such as one come from a bottle and one comes from a cup, uh, will you also be able to increase their correlation a bit after doing alignment or it is completely impossible? We have looked at manifolds for different tasks. For instance, doing the central task with actual ridges versus isometric or doing tasks where the monkey has to put a ball into, um, uh, into a tube and, and watch it fall. And we have a paper in Nature Communications where we show that because the tasks have some degree of similarity, it is possible to align to some extent, but not fully as we were able to align here. Actually, it's a measure of the similarity between the tasks, the degree to which we are able to align the corresponding trajectories. Okay, thank you. So if I'm not misunderstanding, uh, for your empirical manifold, for the missing neuron, you will, for the missing dimensions in each empirical manifold, you replace them with zero, I mean zero firing rate. Yeah. Correct, I said I'm not recording them, you know, from the yeah. point of view of my electrode, they have zero mm -hmm. firing rate. I mean, I was wondering if hypothetically you could record from those neurons, I mean, you could have any numbers for those. So instead of, I mean, repeat, if you repeat your, this analysis multiple times, each time with different uh, random numbers, for the missing units, do you think the result would be changed? No, or? the results would certainly be changed if I did that. But what I should do, if you remember uh, Jan Lecun's talk on, on, uh, on the first uh, evening, he was talking about kind of self-supervised learning in which you essentially complete missing data by predicting it from the data that you have. And that would be a smarter way of doing this than filling the matrix with random numbers. If I fill it with random numbers, I would be shooting myself on the foot. And then I would be like Eric, going home desperate, saying, I quit, I go home. Hi. Thank you very much for the beautiful work. So uh, uh, what do you think is the biophysical uh, reality for this uh, latent uh, <laughs> dynamics? Well, so is there a latent uh, variable <laughs> neuron or some kind of neural network dynamics cause latent structure? So it's, you're asking a beautiful question, really, because there is, if you wish, um, a kind of, um, Oops, I keep on losing this. This is not made for my hair, you know, it's just made for <laughs> people with different hair. Um, we have so far built what I would call a representational point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, we started as, as um, uh, we discussed yesterday, we measured one neuron, we measured two neurons, we measured 10 neurons. We and so we believe each neuron has a representation for some movement property, mm -hmm. maybe, encoding for the speed of the motion, encoding for the direction of the motion. And then here I come and I tell you, don't look at the individual neurons, look at the neural modes, look at the dynamics of the neural modes. And all the information about motion is there. And you can are very free to ask me, well, how do the neural modes acquire their orientation selectivity? But I'll go back and I'll ask you, and how did the individual neurons acquire their orientation selectivity? Is there a little Maxwell demon sitting on each neuron saying you only respond when the movement is 135 degrees? So there is a mechanistic description that is missing in both pictures. But I'm putting forward a, a view in which the building blocks of, of neural, inf the building block of information processing is brain dynamics. And the building blocks of brain dynamics are not the dynamics of individual neurons, but the population dynamics described by these neural modes. But I agree with you that there is a piece missing, which is I should explain, be able to explain to you how do these modes get established and how do they acquire mod properties to represent directions of motion or speed of motion. And we are still lacking that. Thank you. Okay, la last two brief questions. Hi, I, I wonder if you already studied like global properties of this uh, latent manifold, like uh, patching together all the tangent spaces or like the transition functions or something like that? The manifolds I showed you today, the ones that I really showed you are flat. They are subspaces. So they, are, they, are, they, are, they don't have uh, tangent planes. They are their own tangent plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but of course, it's a very interesting question, which is if the manifold was nonlinear, and I do locally linear approximations, how would I patch them? And we ha I haven't showed you any of that data, but there are methods like isomap and local linear embedding that allow you to do that kind of thing. What we have done is um, for very similar eight, eight target central tasks, we, we have done an isomap analysis 
And we have shown to ourselves, we haven't published this, that the, the surface has a curvature. It's not a flat surface, but it doesn't have a lot of curvature. So the geodesic distances that I measure by walking on the manifold are not very different from the Euclidean distances that join the points. They are a bit different, they are bigger, but not very different. So there is a bit of local ondulation, but it's not something that wraps onto itself in a complicated manner that would make the coding difficult. Okay, I think we're going to have to stop there. I know I said two. I, but we can continue let's the coffee continue break. Let's continue with coffee. Be back here at five. Thank you.